Okay, are you guys ready for this? Oh yeah, this is the chapter everybody's been waiting for since that other chapter where stuff was set up for this chapter. Luffy versus Kizaru, One Piece chapter 1093 review, yeah! Okay, I gotta be honest with you, Oda trolled us a little bit with the chapter title this week. Now, it's technically correct, Luffy does in fact fight Kizaru in this chapter, but like... Luffy, right? Main character of the manga going up against an admiral in a straight up fight. If you just, if you just, like, weren't up to this point in One Piece yet, and you saw this chapter title, you're like, whoa, Luffy versus Kizaru, this is finally happening. I need to get caught up with One Piece, man. I need to get back up to where we were. No. So, <laughs> it's like, it's like, imagine in Bleach, where it's like Ichigo fights Aizen, and it's just like, you know, the chapter title, let's say it was like Ichigo versus Aizen, and Ichigo shows up all final gets a ten show like let's go Aizen. Aizen's like this god and he's just like yes Ichigo Kurosaki and it's like ah it's like two eldritch gods battling in the sky you know that that's what you expect with something like this um but uh <laughs> <laughs> Luffy has gear fifth now, so it's definitely, every fight with Luffy from here on out is, is not going to be what you expect, okay? Um, so we'll get to it, but uh, first we have the cover page, right? And we have the cover page, we have Kobe and Helmeppo in a fan request uh, giving their glasses to two Tarziers. Tarziers are very small primates. They're some of the smallest primates in the world. I found this really funny video that really just quickly just summarizes what they are, because I had never heard of them before, so I'll link them that up here or down in the description or something. Uh, Tarziers, though, very adorable. Little primates that latch on to things that have giant eyes, okay? And so Kobe kind of takes his glasses off and gives them to the Tarzier. And I guess he also takes Helmeppo's uh, little goggles, his little visor, and gives it to the other one. I gotta admit, the Tarzier looks way cooler with the uh, with the, the visor than Helmeppo ever did. Speaking of Helmeppo, my hair is finally getting back to the point where I don't resemble Helmeppo anymore. Uh, slowly but surely, we're getting there. So that was a pretty funny cover page this week. Okay, so we pick up right where we left off, okay? In case you forgot, Kizuru has made it to the Labosphere after quickly dispatching Luffy in Snake Man as well as Jewelry Bonnie. Kicked them both outside of the Frontier Dome. Kizuru shows up, just zips right over to the lab, and he's like, hey, all right. Listen, Vegapunk, I'm not happy about this as much as you are. I mean, I mean, maybe you are happy about this, I don't know. But, like, look, this is gonna happen, all right? So just, just chill out and I'll make it quick, right? Because his orders were to kill Vegapunk. At that exact moment, Luffy shows up in Gear 5th in his giant form, and the roof of the lab was already previously destroyed by the attacks of the Seraphim, so giant Gear 5th Luffy really just had to reach in and just grab Kizaru, and he's like, man, I had to tank the Frontier Dome twice. That really hurt. Okay, it's on, Kizaru. So uh, we continue right where we left off. Luffy just picks up Kizaru like freaking King Kong and Fei Ray or whatever, and it's just like, okay, <laughs> time to go for a ride, Kizaru, and Kizaru is, is very chill about the whole thing. From what he said in the last chapter, he's like, oh, so this is the infamous, you know, dot, dot, dot. So, Kizaru probably at least knows a little bit about the sun god fruit, probably not the whole story, but he understands that, like, you know, with Luffy's new wanted poster, he's in his gear fifth form, he's in his awakening. So, even if he doesn't know the whole thing with, like, the Gummo Gummo Nomi not really existing, and the human human fruit sun god form, you know, Nika and everything like that, uh, he he at least understands Luffy awakened his devil fruit, and it was that awakening that allowed him to defeat Kaido of the Hundred Beasts, who was, you know, a Yonko and one of the most terrifying pirates in the entire world. Remember, you know, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, bet on Kaido. Kaido technically did win, but then, you know, Luffy won. I, I would still argue Kaido, you know, overall, he won more than Luffy did. I'll say that. Kaido won, like, three times against Luffy. Luffy only KO'd Kaido one time. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? You know, anyway. Anyway, um, so, I mean, like, if you play rock, paper, scissors with somebody and they kick your ass three times in a row, but you win on the fourth one, do, do you consider that, like, I, I won definitively and truly? It's like, okay, sure, whatever, Luffy, whatever. Anyway, uh, Kizaru is pretty chill, though, all things considered, even though he knows he's dealing with an awakened Devil Fruit user and Luffy's the one that took down Kaido, he's just like, hmm, well... This is a pickle I find myself in. And Luffy's just like, ha ha, time to go for a ride. And just starts whirling his arm around super fast, like a centrifuge or whatever. Or like a crazy, like the tilt-a-whirl ride at the county fair. And then just like spins Kizaru around a lot. And he's like, whoa, Straw Hat, calm down, man. And then Luffy just 
whoa, just whips Kaiser away as fast and far as he can, all right? And uh, he's just like, ah, ha, ha, he went flying, and everybody else is like, okay, we should, I don't know what's going on with Luffy right now, but we should probably take advantage of that and leave. Keep in mind, some of the Straw Hats kind of saw what Gear 5th Luffy was doing, remember? Because, like, at, back at the, uh, at the festival at Onigashima, Luffy got, like, knocked down into the festival hall at one point, and his eyes popped out, and, like, Nami and Law and a bunch of the other Straw Hats were able to see him and be like, what? And, like, okay, and he went right back up. But the vast majority of that fight took place on the roof, and, um, you know, there was, like, the fire in, in Onigashima, so, like, a lot of the Straw Hats had other stuff to worry about. They weren't privy to that fight, so they know Luffy's new form. They know what he looks like when he goes into gear 5th, and then the fight with Lucci, so they, some of them saw it there. So they know what he can do, but they don't really know what he can do. And I don't even think Luffy really fully understands what, yeah, like, it's limitless what he could do, right? So there's so many different combinations of gear 5th we're just, we just haven't seen yet, right? So they're like, okay, you know what? That's crazy. Uh, how about we just let Luffy fight Kizaru? If anybody's gonna fight him, it's gonna be him. And let's let's continue with the escape plan. Let's get out of here somehow, okay? So then we have Atlas, and Atlas is there. Now they all crack the password. We still don't know what the password was, unfortunately, but they did crack it. So they can lower the Frontier Dome whenever they want to now. However, still a little bit of a problem here because all the Marines now have taken control of the uh, Pacifista Mark III's. The second they lower the dome completely, and in this chapter, we find out they can actually lower sections of the dome. They don't have to lower the whole thing at once, which is very handy. But it's just like, look, if we lower the whole damn dome at once, all that's going to happen is all the Pacifista Mark III's, all 50-something of them, are just going to look up, aim, and then fire the shot. So it's kind of the same thing as if the Frontier Dome was active. So Atlas is, like, getting her jetpack, you know, vroomed up, and she's just like, okay, look, I'm going to head down. I'm going to give the order to the Pacifistas because, um, you know, the Vegapunks have the highest order clearance on the island. That was a problem with your but York is all chained up in here, so we don't have to worry about her anymore. So as soon as another Vegapunk gives an order to the Pacifistas, nobody is able to override it. Except they are, because St. Jay Garcia Saturn is here. Unfortunately, Atlas and the rest of the Vegapunks and all the Straw Hats, really, no, nobody on the island, except with maybe the exception of Lucci, know that St. Jay Garcia Saturn is here. In fact, I don't even think Lucci is aware of that. Uh, Kizaru knows, obviously. Kizaru, so is the only one we know for certain would know, and he's currently dealing with Luffy and everything like that, right? So they're just assuming that, like, oh, yeah, the only person that could override it technically is the Gorosei, but they know never leave Marijua, you know, they're way over on the other side of the world, so that, that's not even, it's not even a consideration for Atlas, it's not even like the Vegapunks are not even considering that as a possibility, because you can't give orders via Den Den Mushi, they have to be here in person, so the idea of one of the five elders leaving Marijua and being right here right now is so ridiculous and just out of the ordinary that it's not even considerable as a possibility, so they're like, all we gotta do is just give an order and I'm set and we'll be able to take them over and then we'll be able to lower the dome and get everybody out of here and we'll be able to escape the island and and everything will be okay. Cool. So Atlas is heading down. The Stella body, the main Vegapunk, is like, Oh, Quasar, I'm coming with you too. I gotta make sure Bonnie's okay. Oh, that Kizaru knocking him, knocking her straight through the, the frontier dome and getting pelted by lasers. That's not a nice way to treat a young lady. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Vegapunk is like, I'm gonna go with you. All right, cool. I don't, I, I kind of question that decision, but uh, I stand by it. I guess it's Vegapunk and it's his island. He can go wherever he wants, right? Um, so then uh, Vegapunk tries to contact Frankie very quickly. Frankie's back down there. He's still with Lilith. Uh, the Sunny is kind of upright. They were able to like move that upright. Uh, Vegaforce 1 is still completely obliterated. So you got the Shogun out. And I guess Frankie's next option is like, okay, well, we don't have Vegaforce 1 anymore, which was a giant, giant robot but we still have a giant robot. We still have the Shogun, and so the idea is maybe we can use the Shogun to move the Sunny. You gotta keep in mind a couple of things with the size difference here. Size matters in One Piece. I don't know if you guys knew that. So, um... The Sunny is a big ship. It is way bigger than the Mary ever was, okay? The Sunny is, like, I think 59 meters tall. Uh, you know, getting kind of close to, like, Ors level. Ors was, like, 69 meters tall. <laughs> nice, Ors. Nice, nice. But no, seriously, they, like, the Sunny is a huge ship, okay? Vega Force 1 was able to hold the Sunny in its hands like this, okay? Like, literally, wait, like, with the Mary I have over here, like, the little model I have of the Mary... 
Yeah, so like literally this was what the Sunny was to Vega Force One. That robot, uh, we don't have an exact measurement for it yet, but some people, most people are calculating it out to be at least 300 meters tall. Vega Force One is comparable in size to Surume, to the Kraken, who was also around 300 meters tall, okay? Uh, for also reference, Laboon was 400 meters tall. One Piece sizes, it is so much fun. Anyway, so yeah, that's Vega Force One, able to literally just pick it up. Now in comparison, the Frankie Shogun is a big robot. Robot, but it's not nearly as big as the Sunny, okay? I'm thinking with Frankie's tech and with the cola power and everything like that, it would be feasible for the Shogun to like pick up the Sunny and carry it, but it's not gonna be as easy or fast as Vega Force One. Vega Force One could literally just pick it up and then just run like no big deal, okay? So it's gonna take a little longer but the plan might still be workable just using the Shogun, okay? So Vegapunk's main body is contacting Frankie and is like, hey, um, I, I, I seem to read that Bonnie got knocked out of the Labosphere, like there were two explosions, you know, one was Luffy, the other was uh, Bonnie. Can you confirm that? Did Bonnie get knocked down through the freaking Frontier Dome? And Frankie's like, oh yeah, Kizaru kicked her really hard and sent her flying. And Vegapunk kind of chastises Frankie a little bit, like, how could a young strapping lad like you let that happen to her? You know, and just Frankie Frankie's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go save her right away, it's my duty as a man. You know, that honestly, that's not just for comedic effect, okay? That is something that would actually affect Frankie, because, you know, Frankie is like a man's man and everything like that. He's just like, Kizaru, fight me! You know, but then, no, he kicks Bonnie out of the freaking uh, Labosphere, hits the Frontier Dome, gets nuked by lasers, and she falls down. Frankie is going to feel a measurable amount of guilt for that, okay? Because he was there and he couldn't really do anything, right? So he's just like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go and help him out. Out, all right, uh, we have Sanji over on the second floor building a along with Jinbei and Sanji and Jinbei are there and Sanji's like hey Wait a second. You're gonna go down to the la to the uh, fabrication stratum to rescue Bonnie I'm with you on that one. So now on top of an escape operation We also we also now have a rescue operation on on that as well Luffy was able to come right back up because he's gear fifth and he's super strong and he was able to tank it But Bonnie from what we know of cannot fly uh, Unless she has one of her abilities where her devil fruit allows her to sprout wings or something. I don't know but she can't fly, she doesn't know Soru from what we know of, and now she's uh, trapped on the lower stratum, surrounded by a bunch of pacifista Mark III's and Marines and Vice Admirals, and it's not looking good, alright? So now they have to hurry up, turn off the Frontier Dome a little bit, run down there, rescue Bonnie, get back up, turn the rest of the, you know, get the pacifistas back on their side, lower the dome completely, and then rock it off with coup de burst. There's still a lot of steps to this plan, but I think it could work. I think it could still work, okay? So Sanji hears about this, you know, uh, a young lady in distress, and he's just like, oh, I will come and help you with that. Absolutely, right? And so Sanji's on the way. Um, then we cut back down to the fabrication stratum where we do see Bonnie. So we have the Marines looking around there trying to find her. It's like, stay away from the center of the city. Jewelry Bonnie's here. She has the power of the, uh, you know, unnamed age-age fruit. <laughs> um, but stay away because because you are going to get hit with her power. And we see a lot of the Marines getting affected the same way that they did back at Sabaody, where Bonnie was on top of that building and then using her power and all the Marines were either turning into little babies or old men, you know, so they couldn't fight anymore. And so we see a bunch of old Marines with using their rifles as canes and just like, hey! I remember back when I joined the Marines. And then there's a little kid on the ground, like, crying. Like, I want my mommy, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, that's what her ability is there. Um, there's even one kid that's, like, trying to hold up his rifle, and he can't because it's too heavy. And just like, no, I'm going to be a ween, <laughs> you know? So, um, Bonnie's hiding off to the side. She kind of put her hood up. She's all burned up, but she's not dead. See, Bonnie is, you know, she's still a supernova, all right? People say, like, Bonnie is, like, the weakest out of all the supernovas or whatever. Whatever. I mean, even if she is the weakest, she's still a pirate that's been around for a while doing pirate stuff. You know what I mean? You think getting hit with a bunch of laser beams is going to stop Jewelry Bonnie? You don't know Jewelry Bonnie, I'll tell you what. What would happen with Garp? Could could Garp just walk through the Frontier Dome? Like the laser grid is right here and Garp is just eating a donut or something. You're just like, what's this thing? <laughs> Oh, that feels cool. <laughs> he just like Garp just keeps walking. It's like like stimulating his back or whatever. It's like massaging him. It's just like oh that feels good. Oh that feels nice. Yeah I like that. You know yeah, that would that would be Garp with the Frontier Dome, right? But Bonnie survived, and actually we see how she survived. So she got sent flying by Kizaru, hit the Frontier Dome, got pelted with laser fire, and was dropping to the ground. However, Sentomaru was still alive. Sentomaru got up and caught her. Now. 
I don't think that takes anything away. Like, she didn't hit the ground super hard, but Jory Bonnie still tanked getting hit by the laser grid. That, that still happened at 100%. She took the Frontier Dome at 100%. It's just that she got hit. She might have lost consciousness a little bit. She might have been like, oh, what? And then she's falling. And then Centomaru was still alive, and he's also all covered up in burn scars. And, you know, he got blasted by Kizaru's laser, but he was able to catch Bonnie at the last second. And just like, uh, uh, Bonnie, get out of here. The Marines are coming soon. And so we see Sentamaru back on the ground. So he was... I don't know if he's going to make it through this arc. He, he's not dead yet. He was able to get back up briefly. And he saw Bonnie falling. Was able to catch her. And just like, get away from here. I'll hold him off. <laughs> and then he just falls down again, right? So you now Bonnie is now in Sentamaru's debt there. But uh, it also goes to show just like, you know, Sentamaru was Vegapunk's bodyguard, had known Vegapunk ever since, you know, way back in the day when uh, took Sentamaru off that island with the bears and like adopted him essentially. So it also makes sense that Sentamaru knows all about Bonnie because Kuma and Bonnie had come to Egghead prior to this. And so they, they would have all known each other probably. And so, yeah, it's like um, Bonnie is, is kind of like, all right, I, what, what do I do here? <laughs> what do I do here? I'm, I'm trapped on the fabrication sphere. I'm surrounded by Marines, surrounded by pacifistas. Sentamaru saved me, but now he He's, he's down. Uh, do I just hide? You know, does I run and hide? And if I see any Marines, I can use my power. But, like, that only works on, like, lower-ranked Marines. I don't think her ability uh, would work as well with, like, um, like Vice Admirals and such, you know? Like, if Doll finds Bonnie, I don't think Doll's just, like, you know, Bonnie just has to, like, snap her fingers and Doll will turn into, like, a brittle old lady or something like that. I, I think it's, like, a hockey thing, too. Like, they can resist it. So, yeah. We've seen that uh, at Sabaody. Bonnie was, like, on top of a building when she activated her power. So, for like lower ranked marines or people that don't have hockey defense or anything maybe it's just enough to be in her in her presence in like a perimeter to use the power uh but when it comes to like a really strong person um she tried to use the power on bullet in stampede and she was like very clearly trying to come in like trying to slap bullet in the face like touch him to turn him into a baby uh now bullet was able just to grab bonnie and like pile driver into the ground before <laughs> before she could try anything but i wonder if that would actually work you know what i mean like if her power would have even have worked on somebody of like you know bullets power bullet was essentially just diet kaido so would her power have worked on kaido if she came in physical contact i doubt it would have you know so anyway we're cutting back to the lab now where we we're resuming with Zoro versus Luchi because that fight's happening and it's really funny because Luffy's still like on top of the lab like bouncing around like <laughs> I, I sent Kizaru flying that was really fun oh hey Zoro you're fighting too man <laughs> well who'd have thunk it right oh you're fighting the leopard guy the pigeon dude be careful he's a wily one <laughs> you know and so Zoro's down there and he's just like ah Luffy just just focus on Kizaru I got this. It's okay. Luchi hasn't been relevant in several story arcs. It's okay. You know, and so Zoro is fighting against Luchi. Now, Luchi is in his awakening, but he's also much bulkier than he was. When he used his awakening against Luffy, he was a very slimmed kind of like leopard uh, prioritizing speed because Luffy's very fast. Against Zoro, he's much bulkier. Remember, Luchi also mastered all of the six powers, so he had access to all the techniques that the other CP9 agents used. Uh, so Kumadori was the one that first displayed life return so Kumadori was like remember that scene where he ate all the food in the fridge and came out and he was able to like digest it all at once to become really skinny and then return to normal and then back to fat and then back to skinny and then back to normal that was like a running gag so that was life return that Kumadori could use but Luchi can use it as well and he did use it against Luffy where he was able to make himself much slimmer like in his hybrid form and keep all the muscle but like condense it down so he can move quicker that's the kind of thing that Luchi's able to do so he's uh, applying that even to his awakening form where he has like a speed like it, it actually is kind of similar to gear fourth in a lot of ways where luffy has like a um like a big bulky version of gear fourth which is tank man then he has a slim down streamlined speed version which is snake man and then he has kind of like a half and half 50 50 version which is the default which is bound man okay so those are different forms that luffy has gear fourth kind of the same thing luchi has luchi has an awakening late awakened leopard but he also has like a big bulky muscle version where he's clashing with Zoro here and a much slimmed down version that's meant for speed okay so there's that but even with that as the case with you know Luchi using his awakening fighting Zoro Zoro makes it very clear like hey if this is the best you got you're not even worthy to fight my captain right like so Zoro is gatekeeping here he's like hey listen man 
We're a Yonko crew now. My, my captain is a straight up emperor of the sea, and I am a Yonko commander. I'm Yonko commander Zoro. Uh, you, don't go to, you don't get to him unless you get through me first. I have to approve you, as it were. And Luchi is honestly kind of like okay with this? He's just like, oh, is that so? Well, I suppose the head of, a, of an emperor's commander, an emperor's number two, I guess that's okay. Kind of Luchi also admitting that like, yeah, Luffy really kicked my ass pretty quick, but I, I guess I could take on his number two, I suppose, <laughs> you know? So I, I think Zoro's gonna win this. Uh, Zoro, you know, he, he doesn't really, he, he doesn't even have his bandana on yet. He doesn't even, he's not even fighting seriously. Luchi is like awakened leopard zone. He's kind of giving it all he has. Zoro doesn't even have his bandana on. Luchi, you're creamed. Um, come on back and maybe you can fight against Sanji as number three or Jinbei. I, I don't know if you want to consider Jinbei as the new number three or Sanji as the number three, whichever. Um, t tell you what, Luchi. Luchi. Okay, here's the thing. Which straw hat fighting Luchi would you think would be a pretty even fight? Because honestly, like Luffy, Luchi, we saw what would happen there. Luffy would just devastate Luchi, no big deal. Zoro versus Luchi, I think it's pretty clear Zoro's gonna win this. Um, not as one-sided as it was, but still. Uh, Sanji Jinbei, I think, would be able to deal with Luchi as well. Uh, you know, might be even more, like, even there. But I think, like, a Sanji Jinbei Luchi fight would be somewhere around here. W where would be, like, right here? Would be, like, uh, I could kind of see either way. Uh, Robin versus Luchi would be fun. By the way, we haven't seen Robin. I mean, she's injured last time we saw her, but she's been kind of, like, absent. Like, she was injured and being healed, and then that was, like, the last time we touched base with Robin. So, where's she at right now? But Robin versus Luchi would be a fun fight right about now, using, like, Demonio and everything, right? So, we cut now to outside of the island, where Kizuru got just, like, flung by Luffy. Uh, by the way, when Luffy was doing that, like, tilt-a-whirl thing, I just gotta ask, how do you find enjoyment from those kind of rides? Maybe it's just because I have really chronic, like, like motion sickness, but, like, the tilt-a-whirl or the, the teacup one where you get into the teacups and the teacups spin as they go around, so you're spinning in, like, two different directions at the same time at Wicked Fast, those things are straight-up torture devices for me. You understand? Like, I'll get on a tilt-a-whirl, I'll be so sick, I won't be able to move all day. Like, that has happened before. I've tried that. And I'd be like, literally could not enjoy myself the rest of the day. For several hours, I was out of commission. That's how bad those rides mess me up. I don't understand how any, anybody could ride those things and be like, Woo! and then get off and be like, yeah, that was pretty fun. And then just go and eat a corn dog or something. I'd be like, I'm wrecked for the rest of the day. I can't function, all right? So I, I don't get it. I don't get it, man. But anyway, Kizuru is one of those lucky people, I guess, because he doesn't seem really perturbed by this at all. Dude is sent flying off the island with his arms crossed. He's literally getting sent like a missile, just like, huh, well, that was the power of Luffy's awakening that defeated Kaido, huh? Wow. He's gotten pretty strong. Oh, I'm gonna hit the ocean. I probably should do something. So, it, like, right before he hits the ocean, like, the ocean's here, he's, like, thinking to himself with his arms crossed, like, not a care in the world. And then, like, right about here, he's like, oops, I should probably, shroop, okay. It's made a light. And so he just does that. And then he just uses, uh, I think, the uh, Yasakani Jewel. Yeah, Yasakani no Magatama, Sacred Jewel of Japan, one of the three treasures. And then launches the attack, and then just disassembles himself, and then fires right back to the island. He's made of light. So it's pretty much instantaneous. He zips from like a mile outside the island right back in front of Luffy, where Luffy's seeing all the sparkles and he's just like, oh, okay, a bunch of them. And then, boom, Kizuru clones himself, which is something else, something easily able to do. And I don't think these are just like fake little shadow clones or anything. They're light clones, but like, I would imagine they still pack a punch as well, right? So he makes a bunch of these clones there, just zipping around all over the place. And Luffy, of course, has the, you know, gear fifth cartoon rubber hose reaction of like, what? And his, like, his eyes pop out like, there's a bunch of you. Oh, man, this is going to be weird. Kizuru now activates his light sword. It's been a while since we've seen that. I always like the light sword. Ame no Murakumo activates that and then begins to attack Luffy. And so Luffy's gear 50. He's kind of like dancing around the attack. He's swinging his foot. He has hockey. He's using hockey. Uh, Kizuru cuts him at one point in the face. Uh, he uses Dawn Whip to attack them, but there's just so many that he can't really hit them all at once, to which Luffy has an idea. And he's just like, whoa, hold on a second now. I have to go and uh, do something here. Um, wait, hold on. There's a reference here. He, he calls calls them ghosts. 
Um, oh, okay, okay. So he's comparing the holograms that he saw earlier in the arc, like the giant alien creatures and stuff. He's comparing that to Kizaru. So he's like, what are you, are you those weird ghost hologram thingies? You know, like, which, yeah, technically he kind of is, yeah. Um, Kizaru would be really fun on Halloween. He could just make a light version of himself, like, ooh, I'm a Kizaru ghost. You know, that, that, that would be a fun thing to do. So Luffy starts running away. All the Kizrus file in like a conga line, single file, and just be like trying to attack him. And so it, it, it is really is like in a video game where if you're in a big room in a video game with a bunch of like, uh, you know, creatures you have to fight, uh, depending on how the game is coded with like the AI and everything like that, you could like move around the room like circle strafe and then just more and more of the <laughs> people start falling behind you and then you could just turn around and use your big attack to like wipe them out. That's kind of Luffy's strategy here, right? So he's... Uh, waiting for everybody to get in a nice nice straight conga line and then Luffy uses Dawn Stamp to just like hockey infused his leg to just stretch through all of the clones and hit all of them at once right so he hits all of them knocks them all and they all kind of like scatter like Rayleigh scattering somewhat um there is a reference with that there is a thing called Rayleigh scattering with lights and Rayleigh fought against Kizaru that there, there's a reference there um so he does that and he's like aha I, I bet I definitely hit your real body there to which Luffy then looks down at the lab and the real body is right there in front of Usopp, like holding Usopp up by the throat. And Kizaru's like, hey, so, you know, where did everybody go? Where's Vegapunk? And Luffy's like, oh, come on! <laughs> See, the thing is, that's the thing with Kizaru. Kizaru could be like, hmm, all right, this uh, straw hat kid's gonna be a problem. All right, I'm gonna make like um, 20, nah, probably should be like 50 clones. All right, 50 clones, go deal with him. I'll go deal with, like, Usopp, okay? And so, yeah, Kizaru knows the real threat, by the way. He, he sends a bunch of holograms to go deal with Luffy in Gear 5th. He sends his real body to deal with God Usopp, all right? He knows the kind of threat he poses, okay? He's like, you deserve my undivided, undivided attention, Captain God Usopp, <laughs> you know? So, uh, Luffy's still in the sky, he looks down, he sees Kizaru's there, he's like, wait, what? His eyes pop out, and he's like, okay, no, 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 you can't do that, that's not fair! And so Luffy he goes down to try to grab him, right? Uh, meanwhile, we now have, uh, the Vegapunks. We have the Stella, and we have Atlas getting into the Vega Tank. Vega Tank 8. <laughs> um, it's essentially like, uh, you ever see Jurassic World, uh, those balls that they were in that kind of go around the park and kind of watch all the different dinosaurs and stuff? Imagine one of those gyro balls, but there's two large wheels wheels on the side of that. So a big ball with two wheels, and we have Vegapunk and Atlas inside of that. Um, Sanji also jumps out at the last minute and grabs onto it and is like, I'm coming with! And so Edison is still in the lab, so he can just lower the Frontier Dome just slightly in one specific area so the tank could get out. Vegapunk's in there. Vegapunk is like the old grandpa. He's the one driving it. So Vegapunk's behind the wheel, and he has like the goggles, like old man driving goggles, and he's just like, hold on, bunny, I'm coming. Oh, get out of the way, hot rod. Here we go. Vegapunk's hitting the, I can drive 55, you know? So it's kind of funny. What would have made it even funnier is if Vegapunk put on an old man, like, driving cap, you know, like an old man, it's like, oh, it's time for me to drive. Back in the day, dude, they had driving goggles, they had a driving jacket, no shit, a driving jacket. It's like, ah, Meredith, I'm gonna go for a nice Sunday uh, drive. Where's my driving jacket? Ah, uh, here we go. Where are my driving goggles? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, where's my driving cap? Ah, uh, lovely. You know, where is my scarf? Ah, uh, lovely. I will, uh, actually, I'm gonna put on three scarves so they really flutter in the wind. <laughs> So that's, it's kind of like an episode of Wacky Races here a little bit. I kind of like this, really. So, um, so Vegapunk, though, very committed. He's like, I'll be damned if I stand by while a little girl gets murdered. So, um, once again, I, I don't even know anymore because they've, they're now referencing it a lot, but I don't know if it's a translation thing or what. Um, I'm not really sure with, with Bonnie at this point because they are mentioning it quite a bit. Now, remember, Vegapunk is in his 60s, so he might be referring to it. Bonnie is, like, in her 20s. It'd be like, you know, that is, like, a, a young lady, a young girl to him. You know, just like, I'm not gonna let Bonnie get killed, damn it. Um, once again, I'll bring up, Bonnie was there, like, at least 20 years ago at the founding of 
of Egghead. So unless there's something that gets addressed with that, that's either a plot hole. I mean, Oda could always retcon it, I guess. But I'm just saying that was stated in the timeline. So anyway, yeah, Vegapunk's going down to save her. Um, and uh, Luffy's there, and he's just like, wait, what? No, and, like, I, Luffy's eyes are popping out a lot in this in this uh, chapter. And he's just like, wait, no, old man Vegapunk, you can't go down there. You'll get yourself killed. And then, so that's when Kizuru walks out of the lab, and he sees the Vega tank going down. And he's just like, oh, that's where they went. Okay, that was easy. And he fires up a laser to fire it. Luffy jumps in at the last minute. He eats the laser. Luffy was able to grab a lightning bolt when he fought Kaido, so eating a laser beam, that's fair. That's fine. A lot of people brought up the idea of um, using a mirror against Kizuru. Like, Kizuru's made of light. Can't you just take a mirror and just bounce it right back at him? And we mentioned this before. If, if the laser is focused enough and powerful enough, it's the mirror is not going to reflect it back. It's just going to shoot right through the mirror. But... Luffy is able to make stuff out of his body. We saw him, like, take the goggles out of his hair. If Luffy can really just, like, like hammer space, like, reach into his hair and just pull out anything, if Luffy could pull out a Gear 5th mirror, then I could see him bouncing it back because Luffy's power is, like, Toon Force, okay? So that might work. But in this case, Luffy just eats the laser, and so his whole face lights up like a jack-o'-lantern, like his whole body is, like, a luminescent from inside. And he's like, ah, that's hot, ah! But um, he blocks the shot, and so there's like light streaming out of Luffy, but the uh, Vegapunk's managed to get away. Frankie also latches on, so we have Vegapunk in his old man goggles, like, I'm coming, bunny! You know, put it into second gear, Vegapunk's on the way! And then Atlas is in there, like, yeah, you go, Stella! And then Sanji claps onto the thing, and he's like, I'm coming! And then Frankie's like, I'm here too! <laughs> it is like an episode of Wacky Races, what is this? Alright, so they're, they're heading down, uh, Lilith is there and uh, Frankie orders her to see like hey Lilith use the general Frankie to get out of here now listen Lilith I don't normally allow people in my robot but this is kind of an emergency okay so Lilith I'm trusting you to pilot the Frankie Shogun this is a big deal because whenever the Frankie Shogun is piloted it's always Frankie because Frankie like when like like choppers in the tank you know he has to kick chopper out like this is a one-man craft kind of deal and so Frankie gets in the cockpit and he's just like all right Frankie let's go okay Frankie uh, but now Lilith is gonna be piloting it so Frankie's putting a lot of trust in her I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> to let somebody else drive your pristine Cadillac, or in this case, your pristine giant robot that you built with your own two hands. That has some trust there, okay? So uh, I'm sure Lilith will be fine. She's certified to drive giant robots. I, I think she'll be good. Also, by the way, to bring this up, uh, chicks do in fact dig giant robots. Um, that's a thing. You know, I heard that from a prophet way back when I was a child. Chicks dig giant robots. You dig giant robots. I dig giant robots robots. Nice. Nice. Okay, so um, Edison opens the port, last scene of the chapter, and they're heading down to the fabrication sphere. They get there, and they get there pretty quickly. The Vega tank just whoop, just rolls up, Atlas comes out, and she's like, your new mission is to eradicate every last marine on the island. And you see the same thing with like the radio waves coming out and like receiving in the pacifistas, like new orders confirmed. But at the same time, you have a shot of St. J. Garcia Saturn, who's just sitting there with his eyes closed, like, still on the ship, I would assume, just like, hmm. Now, I thought about it, it could be feasible that he already gave the superior order, so this order might not work, but I don't think that's the case. I think this order will work, but St. J. Garcia Saturn now realizes he has to reveal himself, which is a big deal because nobody else is supposed to know he's here. There's only a select group of Marines that went with them that were very high ranking um, that knew St. Che Garcia was here. Uh, Kizaru, obviously, as an admiral, and Doberman as a vice admiral, he was also aware of Kizaru's existence, I mean, of uh, St. Che Garcia's being there. Uh, maybe a couple other vice admirals knew he was there. But the Marines at large, they don't know he's there. Vegapunks don't know he's there. The Straw Hats don't know he's there. And he exp he explicitly even said to Kizaru and Doberman, like, don't let anybody know I'm here. So this is a big deal, okay? Also, Morgan and his giant, you know, World Economic Times teapot, seagulls, that's up there too floating around somewhere because they were able to intercept a call. So they're, they're hovering around the egghead somewhere, okay? So St. Jay Garcia might be like, he hears that Atlas has arrived and given the order, and he's like, oh, shit. 
All right. I can either let the pacifista Mark III's fight back against the Marines. That's not good. Or I have to leave the ship, get to the island, and issue a direct order to them. That is the only way that the pacifistas are going to obey us. <sighs> Shit. So, St. Jay Garcia is going to have to weigh his options here, but I do think he is going to, he's going to reach the island. Because, like, thematically, what other point would it be for him to be there? We just had the, the five Gorosei big reveal against Sabo. Like, they can go into their forms and Eam can, you know, transform and everything like that. So this is the perfect way to showcase one of their abilities full on, not just in silhouette. Um, St. Jay Garcia was apparently the one that could turn into, like, the giant bullfrog or bison-looking thing. Um, so... I think he is going to, like, you know, Atlas is going to give the order. The pacifista is going to be like, orders received. And then he's going to, they're going to turn on the Marines and fire at them and everything like that. And then Atlas and Vegapunk and Sanji and Frankie are going to be down there. I'm like, okay, we got to find, got to find Bonnie. I think they're going to find Bonnie relatively quickly. Uh, Sanji might find her and be like, oh, it's Bonnie. Okay, great. We got to get out of here. Let's go. And so they're all getting ready to go. And the pacifistas are laying down cover fire. And then at the last minute, that's when St. J. Garcia Saturn arrives and everybody kind of stops in their tracks. And like, is that one of the Gorosei? Now, I don't even know if like Sanji and Frankie and, and Bonnie would even recognize one of the Gorosei. Are their, are their appearances even well known in the world? Like, do they get published in the paper often? I don't know if they do. But Vegapunk would definitely, and Atlas would definitely recognize them. So it might be a thing where like they, they save Bonnie, they try to get back to the Vega tank, and Garcia is just there. And he's just like... And then Sanji and Frankie are just like, who's the old dude? You know, and then all the Marines are like, oh my God, you know, all the vice admirals are like, what? Why is he here? You know, and if they don't already know, so they might be giving him a wide berth and Sanji and Frankie are like, who's the old dude that everybody's scared of? And then Vegapunk or Atlas, you know, might be like, that's St. J. Garcia Saturn. That's one of the five elders. Like what? Like as in five elders, as in like one of the rulers of the world, five elders. Like, yeah. It's just like, oh no. And then he's like, Ugh, this operation has been a real pain. All right, pacifistas, attack them. And then the pacifistas are going to return fire. And then the Vegapunks can't do anything to override that because, of course, the way the Vegapunk programmed the damn pacifistas was to listen to the Garu say, you could have easily just told them that's how it worked and not actually program them that way. But we know Vegapunk is very thorough, so he's probably going to program them that way for reals. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the chapter. Break next week. That's it. Uh, but really solid one. It's just that the whole Luffy versus Kizaru thing, everyone expected that to probably be like some more like epic, like one-on-one -on -one kind of fight. Like, you know, Luffy punches, Kizaru punches. It kind of takes up the whole chapter and we kind of get a gauge for where they're at at the end. I still, honestly, even at the end of this chapter, I'm still kind of a thing where like, we're kind of at a stalemate here where Luffy can kind of do anything he wants to Kizaru. Kizaru can just, rip, you know, repair himself, you know, turn back into light. He doesn't seem to be winded at all. Didn't have a care in the world when he was getting sent flying away. Luffy can tank his... We'll see how well Luffy tanks this laser to the mouth, like eating a laser. How well Luffy tanks that. I'm assuming he could, but it's like, it's once again, it's not so much like... Kizaru's way stronger than Luffy, or Luffy's way stronger than Kizaru, I think it's more just going to be a balance, a stalemate, where it's like, just like, um, you know, immovable object versus insurpassable force kind of thing, you know what I mean? Where it's going to get to a point where Kizaru can't really do anything to harm Luffy, and Luffy can't really do anything to harm Kizaru, although Kizaru was able to cut Luffy with the sword. We haven't really seen any attack so far Luffy was capable of actually harming Kizaru yet. Uh, Luffy used hockey to like attack the clones. Uh, Luffy was able to like attack him and like hit him and grab him and throw him, but that didn't really do anything, right? So I'm, I'm sure Luffy did have some, could do something to harm him, but like, I don't know. I, I, I'm still gonna put money on Kizaru here. I think Kizaru still has a little bit of an advantage here. As with Zoro and Luchi, I think that's already, you know, that's already a, a foregone conclusion. Uh, Zoro's gonna win that. Um, but yeah, we gotta see what's going on with the rest of the Strides, too, and like Frankie and uh, Sanji reaching the lower realm and uh, the lower uh, sphere, I should say, and then where's Robin been at and everything like that. So we'll see what happens. Uh, two week break. Thanks for watching the review, everybody. Let me know down below how you felt about this chapter. This will be Teching signing out. Later, everybody.